Morning everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today for the ShipStation and Avalara Q&A. What does Brexit really mean for your customers? Just as an introduction, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Simpson, the UK Partner Manager for ShipStation. Today I'm joined by Andrew Norman, the MD for ShipStation International, and Richard Asquith, the VP for Global Indirect Tax at Avalara. I know there's a lot of Brexit content out there at the moment, so today we really just want to give you some clear guidance and talk about what Brexit and all these changes actually means for your customers. The session today will last for about an hour, hour and a half, and we will start by sharing some content firstly from Richard, who will talk about VAT and customs obligations. Then Andrew will talk to you about customs fulfillment and returns. We will then open up for questions. Just to let you all know, the session is being recorded and all mics are muted. The chat box will be open throughout, so please fire away with any questions and we'll get through as many as we can. So that's everything from me for now and I will hand over to Richard. Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much Emily for that uh, introduction. Good morning everyone and welcome to um, yet another update on uh, on Brexit, on what, uh, what happened, what changed obviously for particularly for e-commerce world. Um, what we'll try and do today though is really uh, now that we're week, uh, probably week seven, I think, into uh, the post-transition period, um, what's the pain that uh, retailers and anyone else who's moving, in particular, goods across the English uh, Channel? What, what, um, what change and what are the lessons so far? What are the things to um, the pitfalls? And you know, the, the, it very much is a live, uh, moving feast in that um, we're we're spending a lot of our time uh, trying to explain to uh, customers, partners. Uh, what uh, what the next steps uh, they have to take as they try and figure out how to put back together their supply chains or the distribution uh, of goods uh, out to customers, whether it's into Europe or back uh, into uh, into the UK. So um, in terms of, you know, obviously Brexit affected a lot of us in many, many ways, the uh, exiting the single market, the EU customs union, the EU VAT regime, and so many other functions of um, of the European Union. But the big highlights in terms of um, of today that we'll we'll just look at it's it's affected in the UK. No one quite knows, but in the UK, HMRC think about 250,000 UK businesses for the first time ever will have to wrestle with uh, customs paperwork and uh, things like commodity codes and potentially tariffs um, and also foreign VAT in, in new ways. And equally on the other side of the English Channel, it's about another 200,000 European businesses that have been affected. Um, it covers, it's mostly about goods, services were relatively left untouched in terms of VAT and obviously not customs because customs just relates to goods. Uh, B2B took less of a hit, B2C is where it hurts. Um, what in short short measure it means import VAT and extra VAT compliance. We'll talk about that in a moment and how that's affected movement of uh, of uh, goods. Um, to a lesser extent, it's affected uh, digital services. I don't don't think there's anyone who's affected by that on today's audience. But obviously, uh, ask if uh, if you think. Um, uh, it's going to affect you. The other thing which we are going to touch on, um, there are other changes around e-commerce VAT that you should know about that came in on the same day, uh, 1st of January. Next, please. Okay, so um, in big, big news terms, there were two changes um, in terms of e-commerce. Number one is VAT and the UK is out of the EU VAT regime and what that means is two really big two big headlines to take away is number one, if you're moving goods between the UK or the EU 27 member states, or obviously vice versa, uh, if it's on a B2B uh, basis, uh, it used to be zero rated. It was, uh, it's called an intra-community supply. We, we, we like our fancy sounding uh, terminology in VAT and customs, but basically it meant zero uh, VAT. That's all changed now. Um, you will have to pay import VAT if you're moving goods into the EU on a B2B uh, basis for the first time. And um, there are ways to plan around that. And I, I suspect that'll come out in the questions. There's things like postponed accounting, which means deferred import VAT. So if you're very clever, and uh, you get your VAT planning right, you don't have to make the cash payment of the import VAT. But you've got to be very careful because if you're using, for example, freight forwarders, um, they won't be as cooperative about planning your 
the movement of your goods in a way that suits your VAT uh, planning. So a big problem we're seeing at the moment is some of the big branded uh, freight forwarders are clearing goods of retailers, e-retailers from the UK into places like the Netherlands and the retailers just weren't planned for that. So they're getting stuck with uh, huge, huge Dutch uh, VAT import bills. Um, second up, uh, as you remember, I said in the first slide, it's about import VAT and extra registrations. So the registrations, meaning particularly if you're on B2C, uh, if you're a relatively small uh, seller to EU consumers, for example, you could sell under your UK VAT number, charge UK VAT 20% and pay it over to HMRC. Um, until you went over at local thresholds in each country. So Germany, it was about 100,000 euros. France, it was 35,000 euros. We call that the distance selling threshold, and that's all gone. So what we're finding is a lot of e-commerce uh, sellers from the UK, if they're medium or small, or if they're looking at the smaller countries, so thinking of Hungary, uh, Poland, those types of places, it may not be, you're, you're going to be, have to be VAT registered there to continue to sell. And it, economically, it may not just make sense. And then just the last point on this slide, um, uh, a warning. If you are have a foreign VAT registration, if you're from the UK, you may have to appoint a special type of VAT agent called a fiscal representative. It's not all countries. And I get asked all day long, which countries? And the answer is, it changes by the moment. Um, and yesterday, for example, Poland, which does require a fiscal rep, said you don't need one. So uh, in short, as I say, extra import VAT, watch out for your import VAT, watch out if you need extra VAT registrations and need, if you need a fiscal rep with it. Next, please. Now, um, the other thing that's changed because HMRC decided we weren't all busy enough on the 1st of January 2021 wrestling with the magnitude of, of Brexit changes is um, a reform of the e-commerce uh, system and uh, the VAT regime. This is a change that the EU uh, originally designed several years ago and the EU and when obviously the UK was part of it was was designing and putting all these reforms together. The EU is going to go ahead with the same reforms, but on the 1st of July of this year. Uh, the reason there's a separation in dates is because the EU decided to delay for six months because of COVID. Uh, the UK chose not to, and obviously with the UK being out of the EU, uh, that regime, from the 1st of January, it was free to, to go ahead. So the big headlines, and these are really important changes and this has caused a lot of confusion and difficulty for e-commerce sellers, particularly selling to UK consumers. So previously, you could, if you were UK or overseas, you could sell to a UK consumer and not charge them VAT if your goods came from China or the US, if they were below 15 uh, pounds. That exemption is now gone. Uh, foreign uh, overseas sellers must charge UK VAT uh, in the um, in the checkout. And that includes you if you're a UK uh, seller and you've been selling to a, a UK consumer and um, you've been charging it was below 20 sorry 15 pounds. Uh, that that with that exemption that loophole has now gone. The reason it's gone just as background because there was so much fraud. Chinese sellers in particular were just abusing this. Uh, morning, noon and night. And then the last piece I won't spend much time on, but um, if you're a marketplace, you take on the responsibility for many different types of transactions that your sellers may be doing on your marketplace if there's a UK uh, consumer. Now, one thing I'll warn uh, on this that uh, very few people have picked up, HMRC are making retailers who allow other retailers onto their website to sell goods. They're deeming them as marketplaces too. And we think this affects uh, thousands of e-retailers. Uh, um, uh, e and obviously um, it, was, it, it was a feature, it was a development of the market um, that's, that's been bubbling up for three or four years, uh, but COVID accelerated this whole, this whole um, pattern of allowing or extending your categories um, and extending the distribution of your goods because difficulties in supply chains during the various lockdowns. And so we saw a lot of uh, retailers, UK retailers, allowing foreign retailers onto their websites. And then um, now the trouble is there, you're caught there, you're going to be liable for the VAT there where you may have thought up until 1st of January you weren't. So watch out for that one. Next. Um, Here's just a reminder of the EU version. 
which is coming in on the 1st of July. The one, it's, it's much more complicated because there are lots of loopholes uh, in there. So for example, um, on, on point one, the EU's um, VAT exempt threshold uh, today is 22 euros. So that equates to the, um, to the UK's 15 pounds exemption that's now disappeared. Um, that um, you, you, you won't be able to use that anymore. So if you're a UK business selling to a, an EU consumer, uh, you can sell to them today now that the UK is out of the EU VAT regime. You can sell to them VAT free if it's below or doesn't exceed 22 euros. That's gone. So that UK seller now uh, from 1st of July will have to charge EU uh, VAT at the local rate of the consumer in the checkout. So that means um, uh, you're going to have to take on the, the role of live VAT calculations uh, in the checkout, something that we spend all day at Avalara automating. So obviously reach out to us uh, if you want to hear more about that. But it is quite a challenge because on top of everything else, you can't, for example, sell to EU consumers and get, let the EU consumer worry about the import VAT as you can today. Uh, and that's important because post-Brexit, a lot of UK retailers have been uh, relying uh, on that. And then lastly, just like with the UK, marketplaces are held liable for um, VAT on some of their sellers' transactions. Next. And then I think lastly, um, we'll we'll try and cover some of the issues you're going to raise, answer some of the questions you have. But there is, you know, there's frankly just too much going on with Brexit and it's just evolving at a, at a really fast rate. So uh, if you search uh, online for Avalara Brexit Hub, there's a really nice resource where we've gathered together all the various webinars and free download guides that cover some of the things I've just been talking about and a lot more. The, the interesting bit you can see uh, up on the slide there, Essential VAT and Customs Tips. They're the blogs that we write uh, frequently most days where we're being asked questions and if we haven't heard the question before or if it's a new problem, um, things like EORE numbers or if you get your goods stuck in front uh, German airports because you haven't got the right customs clearance, uh, we'll often blog with the answer up there uh, just because it reflects what other businesses are struggling with, so it should be a helpful resource. Next, please. Good, now I think, uh, hand over to Andrew. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making time. Um, I think, Richard, you and I might do some of this together, because I was just looking at some of the, the great points that you uh, raised in, in, your, in your slides, and there's a lot of overlap. So, what I'm going to try and talk you through for our collective um, merchants and retailers is following on from Richard's point, some of the, I guess, the mechanical and more um, practical and operational um, considerations for, for retailers today in, in the post-Brexit world. So touching on some of the things that R uh, Richard um, went through, uh, customs, uh, fulfillment uh, and returns, um, I think are the three areas that we see and, and um, similar to Richard, you know, we, we've seen some um, slightly chaotic scenes, I think, over the last couple of weeks, particularly with some of the uh, the carriers. You know, a lot of the carriers were um, making very last minute changes. I think like a lot of uh, people in this market trying to um, see how the, the negotiations unfolded. Um, and so we're going to we're going to talk through the things that your clients, our collective clients should be. Um, thinking of and, and also giving you kind of our observations of what we've seen over the last um, the last six weeks. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. So, Richard, please uh, feel free to jump in on this because I'm, I'm sure we're going to get some questions, so we might be able to uh, speak to some of these up front. But again, it varies kind of per uh, per carrier. So um, there are we'll come on to this in the next slide, but obviously there are different options of how you can fulfil products. Some of that is going to be fulfilled by uh, your merchants at our merchants uh, warehouse so they might be fulfilling themselves some of them might be using a, a third party logistics uh, provider which might be closer to the consumer in, in Europe or they might be even using drop ship so if we look at this through the lens of um, the retailer fulfilling themselves then um, this is not an ex exhaustive list of things that they need to um, consider um, but these are the things that we've seen tripping people up over the last couple of weeks so the ERE number, is, uh, as Richard alluded to, I think, Richard, this comprises their VAT number, right? And some prefixes around that is my understanding. Yes, that's right. So it's a number that 
uh, you use to identify yourself to the customs authorities and um, I think as your um, and this is I would say this is the biggest problem today that we get uh, ERE numbers uh, economic operator registration identification number uh, in that a lot of businesses and HMRC wrongly uh, advised people on this a lot of UK businesses thought they could get an uh, an EU ERE number they can but it's not sufficient to import the goods into the EU you're going to need a um, uh, an ERE number that's attached to a, a UK, sorry, an EU uh, residency. So that could be an individual or it could be an accounting firm or a lawyer. Uh, usually, and this is the problem, usually it's freight forwarder will provide you with their ERE numbers. But we've noticed, um, Andrea, and I don't know if you've had this too, a lot of the freight forwarders are refusing to do that now. And I was talking to one the other day and we were asking them why. And they said, uh, firstly, there's just too many UK companies uh, asking for this, and the problem is the freight forwarder takes on the uh, on on the customs duties and the import VAT liabilities. So, whilst they will charge you a lot of money to give to give you uh, their ERE number for your customs clearance, um, nothing really is going to cover them for the extent of the liabilities if they take on lots of UK. Uh, importers and then the other reason is which linked to that is they're just very concerned about the levels of insolvencies that are coming with COVID so if they do take on this uh, customs indirect representative role uh, they could get le left stung with uh, huge uh, import tax bills. So we're seeing again this is um, something maybe you can help just correct so that ERE number is required for outbound uh, deliveries and for returns is, is my understanding. Um, yeah, so you need it for the export and the import. So if you're sending goods out of the UK, you'll have to do a customs, uh, an export declaration, and you'd need your your GB ERE number, and that you can get from HMRC. You should already have it. They were they were spraying them out like confetti last uh, uh, in 2019 when we went up the Brexit No Deal hill three or four times. Uh, but you can get it fairly quickly. If you're non uh, non EU, uh, you can sorry non UK, you can get a GB ERE number. But again, um, that won't cover it for uh, bringing goods into uh, into the UK. You're going to need um, just like I talked about the EU uh, customs indirect representative. You're going to need someone here in the UK. Freight forwarders seem to be more helpful. So that's the 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 UK side, the GB side. And then on the EU side, uh, as I said, uh, you're going to need one there. And as I just said, it's got to be a, a linked to an EU uh, residency. Great, thank you. Um, I think we've touched on the um, the DDU as it used to be referred to, or DAP as I guess it's now referred to, and, um, and fully landed costs. Um, I, I think your, your point was right on in terms of some of the marketplaces. And this is obviously about experience, right? Um, you don't want to land your consumer with a with a with an ugly experience on the other end, where they're having to pay the the duties. Um, the other thing, commodity codes, HS codes, harmonisation codes, um, Avalara have a great service for providing those. This is probably one of the biggest areas. Um, it's physically just for generating labels. You know, the majority of people we work with are are doing our are, are B two C. Um, we're not um, currently in the sort of LTL and the freight um, space day to day. But the two things that we are seeing with, um, particularly with carriers, you know, different carriers have different rules, different carriers have different levels of sophistication around their sort of ability to validate this. Sometimes the merchant or the retailer needs to provide the ERA number up front to the, to the carrier. Um, oftentimes they can actually just pull it through through the APR, the XML feed that we're giving them. So ERA numbers to Richard's point is definitely um, uh, just required and, and is causing some challenges for people not having that or not applying it in the right way and, and definitely harmonization codes we are seeing um just the generation of actual labels for shipments um causing issues sometimes people are putting the wrong number of digits or they're invalid or they may even be um prohibited items which um, is another thing that we're seeing maybe some of the carriers are changing their principles or the policies of what they're prepared to carry and we are seeing some some challenges um, around the, the HS codes. I don't know, Richard, if there's anything you want to add on the HS codes. Obviously, I know that you have a very um, complete service or, or any comments you're seeing around um, the HS code uh, challenges at the moment. 
Um, well, it's it's very much as you say. The problem is data. Um, n nobody in the UK has had experience of putting together clean data that you can run through um, the sort of automated solutions that we have. Um, so uh, it, it can be a challenge. I think the one concept, the one good concession is if you're bringing goods into the UK, you only need six uh, digits. You can rely on the um, uh, on the on the world standards HS uh, codes. Uh, you do need a minimum, as you say, there minimum of eight to get goods into the uh, into the EU. Um, I think the the other question, I, I don't know if it's going to come up in another slide, is tariffs. Oh, are we going to talk about that? No, I haven't covered that. So you're welcome okay. to speak to that now if you want to. Yeah, I suppose tariffs is uh, it's up there with E or E numbers in the ever fast changing top 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 of the pops Brexit top of the pops. Um, I'm not going to coin that phrase. I think that phrase deserves to die. But uh, in, in the top of the pops for Brexit uh, is, is tariffs. And the reason why is because you'll all recall um, those of you that had nothing better to do on Christmas Eve than to look out for the trade and cooperation agreement. It was billed as a as a no tariff free trade agreement. And I'm sure lots of you have already realized that's not quite true. And we're all having to learn of this new content. Uh, rules of origin, which means um, just to give you a use case. And this one, I think, popped up in the news um, a, a week or two ago. It was a famous UK high street retailer um, who has retail outlets uh, in different uh, different member states around the EU. They import, I think it was pajamas from Bangladesh uh, into the uh, UK, sit them in a UK warehouse, and then distribute them around the UK and into their retail stores in the EU. Now. Under the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, if goods originate from the UK, they're allowed to be sent to France or Germany, uh, zero tariffs or preferential tariffs, we call them. However, you must be able to prove that they did originate from, uh, from the UK, uh, because otherwise, as you can imagine, everybody would see that as, an, as a nifty backdoor to get goods into the EU tariff free from places like China. So. In the case of that retailer, because they weren't able to show clearly that these goods, pajamas, uh, originated from the UK, uh, they came into the UK, they were charged tariffs there, and then the retailer moved them to, I think it was France, where they had a store, several stores, and the French spotted this and said, right, you're going to pay EU tariffs as well, because that's clearly not UK origin, rules of, uh, under the rules of origin. So what it means, and we think um, a lot of uh, retailers Obviously, e-commerce are going to get stung heavily on this. There's a real uh, double tariff jeopardy going on here because many of them will bring goods into the UK from, let's say, China or Vietnam, low cost production countries, and then pay tariffs into the UK and then get stung for the second time. So the ways, the quick ways around that uh, that we see other people doing is, number one, bring them into a bonded warehouse uh, in the UK. No, I'm sure most of you are familiar with those. Um, a bonded warehouse essentially means they're physically in the UK, but they haven't gone through customs clearance, no customs duties or import VAT has been paid. You can sit them there until you decide what you're going to do with them. Are you going to sell them through the UK or are you going to sell them through France or Germany? And then once you've made that decision, you can ship them, you can clear them through the UK and put them on a boat to France and then only pay tariffs once. Or you can, uh, and you can split your goods and send some of the goods immediately to the EU. The challenge with that is obviously um, you, uh, you're you going to pay, uh, sorry, you're gonna have two, uh, two inventories and all the problems that brings with returns and obsolescence. Yeah, that's great perspective. I think what we've seen um, to some of your points, Richard, is uh, it's all really about business rules and, and business process automation. I think, um, Making sure that those rules get applied is is something that we're focusing on a lot with um, within our product to make sure that we can automate um, a lot of these decisions. Um, you know that the retailers are having to make on a frankly on an order by order basis. So that's something we're going to continue to um, to invest in over the over the next couple of weeks. Next slide, please, Emily. Oh, I can go back one. Uh, Richard, feel free to jump in on on some of these. I think we we kind of just alluded to some of these. So. I think what we're seeing, particularly on merchant fulfilled orders, as we just touched on, um, what we're seeing is really that necessity for that automation and, and 
and that business process automation, you know, uh, applying ERI numbers, applying um, the rules and the logic on a per carry basis. Each carrier has different requirements. Some create customs declarations for you electronically um, and some don't. And so there are things like that, which you just need to be, uh, your, your retailers, your merchants need to be aware of, which obviously we can help with. Um, that's, that's part of our core proposition. I think uh, this would be good to get your perspective on this, Richard. I think what we're starting to see is a lot more interest and discussion is, is really this idea of distributed inventory. Um, at the moment, uh, historically, a lot of our, uh, certainly a lot of our clients have fulfilled, fulfilled from the UK outbound uh, into Europe for, for obvious reasons. Um, and we definitely get a lot more uh, inquiries and interest in having distributed inventory around Europe to get it closer to the, to the EU uh, consumer for outbound and also for for a consolidation of returns. Um, dropship is, is for, obviously for a lot of resellers, you know, that might not be um, as economically attractive, um, but it's definitely sins of uh, extending range or, or entering, new, um, entering new categories, you know, again, using dropship partners that are physically uh, domiciled in, in, in the EU may well sidestep some of the friction and some of the economic challenges around that. So this is something that we're, cons that we're seeing more and more and more. Um, what we're doing uh, in the background is we, we've done this in the US. Uh, we've created effectively a virtual network of 3PL partners, uh, which are all connected into ship stations. So you can effectively share, set up the um, 3PL partner as just another ship from location. So those orders can be routed to that partner in France or Belgium or Germany or whatever. Uh, wherever they um, they need to be, so we're we're actively working on that, which um, some retailers um, you know may want to take advantage of. Some will, will, will already have their own 3PL partner, um, so that's definitely something that we are uh, seeing and we are um, enabling from a, from a technology. I don't know if there's any comments on that, Richard, in terms of any considerations or things that retailers would need to um, to look out for. Um, I think. Watching what everybody's doing, the, the smaller, the smallest retailers are are using the service of the of the freight carriers um, and the national postal services, and they you you can see they've started to launch these um, DDP like services where they will clear the goods still under they'll clear the goods into the EU under your customer's name but you will collect the VAT and uh, any potential duties still in the checkout. Um, and so you'll, you'll make the cash settlement to the, um, to the tax authorities. Uh, so I think, so for example, Royal Mail are, they may have done it in this week, I can't remember, or next week, they're launching a, an interesting service around that uh, to, to match some of the other uh, carriers. I think um, the, the one thing about that is obviously the cost, and Andrew, you already mentioned that, um, I was looking at the Royal Mail charges and I tried to, or we tried to guesstimate when does it become economical to to not do that and take care of your own customs and VAT uh, clearance. And it, it's relatively low numbers of shipments. I think if you're anything below 200 shipments a year, so that's really not very much, then uh, it's the economics starts to change and you should think about um, going to your own clearance. Uh, then I think secondly, uh, I already said this, be careful, whoever you're using, what, what we've seen is most of the um, freight companies are, um, they're only clearing through the Netherlands. And um, um, I was talking to one, it was a, um, a bookseller and they'd got lots of VAT registrations around Europe the other day. And they're, they're, all the freight forwarding companies that they talked to said, we're only gonna bring them into the Netherlands, we're gonna clear them through the Netherlands for you and then, deliver them on to your customers around Europe and so as I said uh, they got stung there so just make sure whatever your your, your VAT and your customers planning in is it matches the realities of um, the service that uh, that you'll get so I think that's it on this one yeah great stuff thanks Richard uh, next slide please Emily um, this I think will definitely be a joint effort because I think this is one area that hasn't really fully played out. Uh, you know, my observations are that in the UK, particularly relative to other countries, retailers have really started to um, embrace and um, really think through consciously returns. You know, I think, you know, going back not that long, returns was just a difficult process that really a lot of retailers and at a finance sort of PL level was just a difficult conversation. 
And I think in recent years, the, the UK uh, retailers particularly have realized that there's a very direct correlation, as many of us, as, as we all know, the direct correlation between the returns and the return policy and the, the ease and the frictionless returns has a direct correlation into performance and, and conversion. I think with uh, Brexit, this becomes, again, very, very challenging, right? So um, the risk of state and the obvious is how, how do we how do we make it uh, as low risk as possible for, for the EU consumer to buy from us? Um, just on a personal level, I bought something from Brabantia, um, a great product, but obviously they're based in Belgium. And I bought it just, uh, I think I bought it just before Christmas and then wanted to return it after Christmas, which was a bad plan on my part. So returning an item uh, to Belgium couldn't have been more difficult, frankly. So. You know, I think what we again, what we're seeing, this is an area we're investing uh, more and more in over the next uh, next weeks and months. Um, some of this is very obvious, right, and, and, and has been going on during the pandemic as well as Brexit, but around the timelines and, and giving uh, the consumer more, um, just more time, you know, frankly, to, to think that through. We're definitely seeing some challenges with the carriers or, or changes, is probably a better word, pol policy changes. You know, some of the services that that existed, which were kind of pan-European. Uh, returns there's definitely some decisions that some of the carriers are making again whether they continue with that service or, or to Richard's point earlier on there are some now additional charges um, uh, for those returns um, the customs process around this that there are still requirements you know around returning those items um, it might be something Richard I don't know if you're able to speak about this but the return goods relief um, that's something that you know again we've um, we've had a lot of questions on that. We don't, if I'm honest, we don't have a great answer for that because that's not part of our our core um, product right now, or that will be in, in coming months. Um, so that might be some questions that we may have around that. Uh, and then partners, you know, we are um, again working with partners in this space, uh, people like Zigzag, and again other consolidators and 3PLs who can consolidate those returns. Um, some of the things that we're seeing, you know, do you want to bring those items back at all? Do you want to dispose of them in country? Do you want to resell them, you know, on, on other on other channels? Um, so I, I think, again, I don't know what your sense is, Richard, but it feels to me this is quite a, this is almost sort of a slightly lagging um, um, challenge uh, post-Brexit of how returns is is um, is dealt with and how, how people address those um, those problems over the next uh, weeks and months. Yeah, I think this this one is is bubbling up in the past week or two um, as the next big issue uh, on the on the Brexit conveyor belt. And um, I think the good news is what I'm hearing is uh, if you contact HMRC, uh, they're very sympathetic to this on um, on avoiding you know getting getting the return goods relief, uh, avoiding paying um, import VAT for uh, a second time. So. Um, you know, practically until we get some better conclusions, uh, definitely reach out to HMRC. We we found them super helpful on this, on getting a sort of a, a, a unilateral agreement or compromise uh, with them. Great. Next slide, please, Emily. Um, I think well, that's the content that Richard and I had. We were going to open this up to to um, to Q and A. I think there's a panel, as Emily such alluded to at the beginning, where you can add your questions. I think we already have some questions in there. Um, I think Richard, you and I will just try and do our best to answer these as these come in. We may be some that we have to park or come back to. Um, and we also have put uh, Emily's and um, uh, Mark's details on there. So if there's something that we don't answer or, or Richard and I need to come back to you, then we'll make sure that we reach out to you through either through either Emily or Mark who can answer that question in more detail. I don't know, Emily or, or Heather, if you or, or Anna, if you want to start the questions. Yeah, um, I've got some questions here. So thank you, um, Richard and Andrew. As you said, we've had some questions submitted already, but please feel free to just keep firing them into the box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so, firstly, please could you clarify when sending packages from UK to EU countries, do we need our GB or EU EORI number? Do you mind um, taking that, Richard? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, to send the goods out of the UK in your ex export declaration, you'll need your GB number. And then to get them into the EU, you will need an EU EORI number. And uh, it can't be one that's been provided that's been given to a UK company. Uh, as I talked about, you're going to have to get um, a customs uh, indirect 
representative to help you out there if your freight forwarder won't do it. So your goods will get blocked if you can't uh, if you can't do that. So you can reach out to your freight forwarder. Uh, it's something that we do at Avalara. We um, we offer a fiscal rep service on on the VAT side, and similarly on customs clearance, uh, we have a service now where we'll um, we uh, we will give you our uh, EU ERE number, and you can just put that into your customs declaration. So uh, so it's an annoying habit. I think uh, just. Going on about this, I, I did talk about this a lot in the slides, but um, what was what caught everyone out on this, and this is why HMRC was, and it still is giving the wrong guidance, or its wording isn't quite proper, I think, and it's slightly misleading, is um, this obligation came in about 10 years ago where non-EU businesses weren't allowed to um, be the declarant for imports, but most of the governments didn't. Uh, most of the member states didn't implement it very strictly. So, uh, you know, pre-Brexit, we have we have lots and lots of uh, Chinese customers, and they are allowed to import and be the importer of record um, uh, on the customs declaration. And most of the tax codes say things like you you're allowed to occasionally import if you're from a third country. However, with Brexit, and you can read into the motives uh, as you wish. The tax authorities have come down hard, I'm afraid, on UK companies, and that's why we say you will need uh, uh, an ERE uh, number with uh, that's linked to an EU uh, address or a, a company address or a, a, an individual's address. I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, and if we ship everything DDP to the EU, how do we avoid paying VAT twice? So. Um, uh, I don't know why it'd be twice exactly, but let me take you through how I how how we see businesses doing that. So if um, if you've got consumers in um, in Europe, uh, you're selling from the UK, and you want to take care of the uh, if the import VAT, so you can there's, there's different ways to sell. You can either sell from UK stock or you can sell from a Dutch stock warehouse. Um, so let's let's take it from you're selling from the UK. What you'll do is um, you can either uh, leave the import VAT to to be paid at the border. I'm go I'm going to run through about three different options now, so uh, bear with me. And by the way, it's all on that Brexit VAT hub. Uh, there's a there's a blog which covers this in, in minute detail. But anyway, I'll try and go through the headlines. So uh, you can leave it to your customer uh, and they'll get a nasty surprise. They'll have to pay the import VAT. And obviously the questioner didn't want that one. Uh, they want to take care, they want to do a DDP. You can, you can um, leave it to your customer legally, but you take care of it for them. Uh, and I mentioned this as a use case. Uh, if they just uh, tick the right box in your T's and C's, you can pay the import VATs for them. So you're only paying it once. Um, or you can get VAT registered in, let's say your customer's in Germany, you get VAT registered in Germany. And then what happens there is um, Germany does offer a postponed VAT accounting regime. So what that means is you bring the goods into Germany, you clear them through customs uh, in Germany, and you ship them on to your German uh, consumer. You don't have to make a cash payment, and uh, you can declare the, or you can make a. It's a, effectively it's a book entry, double entry under the what we call the reverse charge in your next German return, and it's a it's a positive and a negative, and they cancel each other out. But the the point is, there's no cash payment. Now, um, I think on the UK, if if you're bringing goods into the UK, by the way, the HMRC did launch a postponed VAT accounting regime. Um, from the 1st of January and um, those you've been around a few years like I have uh, we used to have one of these back in 1984 uh, and at the time the Chancellor Kenneth Clark said it was too generous and he was cross subsidizing all the EU exporters into the UK so he scrapped it but now it's back in fashion um, so we've the UK's brought it back uh, the, the one point I would make about postpone VAT accounting, how to avoid uh, paying import VAT, as the question is asking, is not all um, postponed VATs uh, or regimes are the same in all the countries. So the German one, it's a bit tricky and you can easily get it wrong and you really don't want to uh, have that because otherwise you'll have to pay import VAT. At the, uh, at the border, you can still claim it through, reclaim it through your next German VAT return, but the point is cash flow wise, you've, you've 
you, uh, you, let's say for three or four months, you've had to um, suffer the loss of the import VAT. So you will get it back. So uh, in short, um, the best way is to get VAT registered and make sure it's in a country that has a good postponed uh, VAT accounting regime. Great, thank you, Richard. And what are the customs requirements for Northern Ireland? I've actually got two about Northern Ireland, so maybe we can um, answer both at the same time. The other one was, are customs docks required for GB to Northern Ireland shipments at the moment? I believe there's a grace period until the 1st of April. Um, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a VAT legend. I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed when it gets to customs on this, but I, unfortunately, like all of us, I've had to get to know uh, the Northern Ireland protocol uh, quite a bit. So uh, Northern Ireland to GB, there is nothing required. Uh, GB to Northern Ireland, there is a grace period uh, until 1st of April, and we expect there to be uh, a grace period, a further grace period. But um, there's other requirements, depending on the types of goods, if they're uh, customs or excise goods or if there is there's no leniency on some of the um, food-based products so there is uh, sanitary and photosanitary uh, certifications required and that's why at the moment you're seeing um, all this fuss about uh, sausages and um, that was that was good uh, dog on cue for my for my sausages quote whoever mm -hmm. arranged that thank you very much um sausages and uh and cheese there's there's problems there so um there probably will be um uh further uh postponement on the on the paperwork the problems are is um people like uh amazon have for customs goods so alcohol uh, excise goods i should say not customs um, they've stopped accepting shipments from GB to Northern Ireland on uh, things like alcohol, and I think they're going to shut out food, uh, food-based products um, as well. I think that was the first question. I, I have to say, Northern Ireland has um, somehow overtaken some super, super stiff competition from the likes of Italy and Poland to become by far and away the most complex VAT regime in Europe. And frankly, if we were in a World Cup, Northern Ireland would get to the final with Brazil, a VAT World Cup, if you like, and they definitely take Brazil in terms of VAT compliance complexity. They take Brazil into extra time. It's uh, it's fiendishly complex. And I keep going on about the Brexit hub. There's a really great blog where we've put down all the use cases of if, if, if you are dealing with Northern Ireland, goods from Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland into uh, GB. We've done all the use cases for where you should charge UK VAT or uh, EU VAT on, on that for both B2B and B2C. Great. Certainly, for B2, certainly for B2C orders, just to add to that, we Sounds a bit of a vague answer. I apologise for this. You may want to check out the ship station um, support sections for carrier by carrier. But to Richard's point, some of the carriers do require an ERE number um, for Northern Ireland shipments, and some do not. So I think we're in that sort of transition. Uh, sorry, transition is the wrong word. We're in that um, adjustment period where different carriers are on different have different levels of requirements. So the short answer is that the customs requirements slightly varies uh, by carrier from a from a b2c perspective um, if you have any specific questions or any of your retailers have specific questions that they can check out our support section which has a carrier by carrier um, breakdown of that information brilliant thanks um, and when we sell from us to the uk do we need to issue vat invoices um, you don't, but what you do have to do now is um, a commercial invoice for customs purposes. And this is under the new rules, um, the e-commerce VAT rules that came in on the 1st of January that I talked uh, talked about. So the requirement there for a UK, sorry, for a US seller or any overseas seller, so a, a French seller now, a Japanese or a Chinese seller, as far as the UK can, is concerned, you're all overseas, you're all Johnny foreigners, and you're going to have to get, you're going to have to follow these new rules. Um, so, as I said, in, um, you're going to have to charge VAT in the checkout. You're going to have to show, you're supposed to show the VAT in the checkout uh, for your UK uh, consumer. You don't have to produce a full VAT invoice, but what, um, what HMRC say is uh, you should produce a commercial invoice. And I think practically that means a, um, 
a CN22 and a CN24, if I uh, if I've got my numbers right, uh, which are the uh, the the and Andrew probably knows more about this. These are the labels that you have to attach to uh, your consignments as you ship them through. And the CN22 is the basic one, um, which just has obviously ship addresses, uh, list of the goods, commodity code. Um, it's supposed to have, if you're a US um, seller, it's supposed to have your UK VAT number so customs can see that you've correctly charged VAT in the checkout and they can check that against your VAT number. And um, CN24 is just a, a longer version, more details. I can't. I can't remember the threshold for it, but I think it's several hundred pounds tips you over into a more detailed um, the CN24. So you, they're effectively your customs invoice. Uh, so you, um, if you if you look up a CN22, you'll see what they look like. It's worth saying the changes that HMRC made right, was to really kind of level the playing field. I think as you touched on on your slides, you know there were some eBay particularly were getting lobbied very very heavily. Um, to try and level a playing field for merchants and and, and correct that 20% advantage that a number of sellers um, were yeah. you know were benefiting from. Frankly, that was really, as you say, it was it was perfect timing to to roll that in at the same time as Brexit. I think it kind of almost got lost in amongst the noise and the chaos of Brexit. But it's definitely, um, I guess, in positive sense, is, is level the playing field a little bit for some of the UK-based retailers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, e-commerce and high street. Is, is number one and then secondly the, you know, there was 1.5 billion pounds missing because of this problem and um you know that's that's hospitals and roads and the police service etc not getting paid for that's what tax is about is paying for public services so um you know as a, as a tax man you can imagine i'm very pro more more tax but um I, i'm not exactly pro more tax i'm i'm anti-tax loopholes that mean um you know the tax burden falls more onto the resident uh, taxpayers, and uh, which means you and me, because if we don't take care of these lo loopholes, then we pay more income tax. Next question, Emily. Right, thank you. Um, just another one on the US. I think you've probably answered most of that in the in the previous question. But do we need when we sell from US to UK? Do we need to include our VAT or EORI number on the shipment label, or just the commercial invoice? Um, it, oh, Andrew, you, you can go ahead if you want. I think I think it's on the commercial invoice. I need to check whether that's on the label too. I need to check that. Okay, no worries. Richard, anything to add on that? I don't, it's not on the label. I thought it would be, um, but uh, the ones I see being uh, published from Royal Mail don't seem to want that number uh, on. So it'll need to be on the customs uh, declaration. Uh, somewhere in the paperwork, you're going to need an ERE number and a VAT number. The ERE number is because obviously uh, every shipment's got to be attached to somebody and that's via the ERE number. And on the VAT number, as I mentioned, they want, sorry, the VAT number is on the, uh, is on the should be on the label. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned, HMRC at the border, they will take a note of your number and then they will check uh they will, they will note down that you've shipped through goods and they can see the the um the intrinsic value that's the the, the customs value and they'll take a note of that and then they'll check that against your next vat return so if you're a UA, us company you should be uk vat registered now and they'll see that you're properly declaring in your vat return that vat that you should have now charged in your checkout okay. Thank you. And how do I change commercial terms from DAP to DDP? I'm not okay. sure what that question means. Does that mean sort of mechanically? Yeah. Or, I mean, those are those are business policies. I think the the jump in, Richard, if you feel different. I think the main guidance, of course, is you know, is the is the consumer experience right, particularly for the B two B, sorry, B two C, which I think is the majority of, of we, that we talked through today. So the guidance, obviously, is to have um, is to have a fully landed cost DDP wherever possible um, for the you know for the for the obvious reasons of the consumer experience. So yeah. the um, the mechanical process around that. Um, I think we've touched on some of that in terms of the provisions you need to make for uh, for registering and collecting tax. Um, 
and then that's selecting the right um you know you know the right process or the right partner or the right carrier to you know to actually um deliver those those goods that are fully landed okay. i think you've got any more comments on that richard no i agree with that it's it's a matter of negotiation with your customer and you change it through your terms and conditions um and uh, and then obviously yeah as, as you say andrew you've got to make the adjustments in um in, in your customs declaration and um, make uh, your you, you become the importer of record i mean that from the customs perspective maybe this is what the person's asking you're you when you switch from one to the other you're you're becoming the importer of record so you take on the responsibility for doing the declaration and paying any tariffs if they're due and certainly paying uh, the import vat so they're once you've agreed it with your customer, you change your T's and C's, then they're the processes, as Andrew say, that you've got to go through. I guess it's about tra it's about transparency, Richard, to some degree at the checker. Right? Nobody wants a surprise. So I guess it's about not only changing your policies and your business or your business policy, but also rendering that as best you can at the point of transactions so that the, the consumer actually knows, you know, what they're what they're in for, as it were, or, or not, as the case might be. Yeah. And What's amazing is it's actually quite hard to find um, sellers selling under DUP um, because it's such a nasty experience. And the marketplaces won't let you do it anymore. They've stopped it several years ago. Um, as I think we touched on, uh, Amazon will force you to have already cleared the goods from the UK into the EU and stick them in a warehouse somewhere. You're probably in one of Amazon's um is it six, seven, six, they have six, seven, eight uh, FBA warehouses, um, if I, including the UK now, so you have to move them there. And eBay are, I think eBay are the same now, it's all, mm -hmm. all everything's got That's to fine. be clear. Uh, yeah. uh, otherwise, it's a lousy experience for their, for their shoppers and they won't appreciate you doing that. Uh, next question, please. Great, thanks for that. Um, what is the best way to calculate duty when, as a business, you want to pay for the customer? Um, I guess that's a, I don't know if that's something, because you have a service that's, that does some of that, I guess, yeah. Richard, right, in terms of the calculation at checkout? Yes, um, so we have, um, we have two tools to do to help there. Uh, one, the first step in calculation. So if you think what goes into, and I, I, I can't remember whether it was uh, Emily or Andrew who mentioned the information you need to uh, to calculate your your tariffs. So it's there's quite a few components where the goods are coming from, where the goods are going to, because that, that has to be referenced to whether there's a, any free trade agreement. And obviously there is between the UK and uh, an EU now. Then you have to know once you've understand, understood that, where the destination is, and you have to look up the uh, the tariffs uh, for the particular goods. The step before that, sorry, I should have said, is you've got to put a code, and Andrew talked about the HS codes. So if it's going into the EU, it's probably eight digits, and if it's going into the UK, it's uh, probably six digits. You've got to add in all the components of what customs, they call it the intrinsic uh, the intrinsic value. So that is the price of the goods that you're declaring on the customs declaration. If uh, if transport and insurance is included in the price, uh, that's in there as well. And then you add on, um, then that's the base cost, the intrinsic value that you use to calculate, to uh, you, that you can uh, use to calculate based on your HS code lookup table. So, um, there's there's quite a few things in there, and there's there's other components which I haven't touched on. Um, so what we do is um, we have we have two tools that help there, uh, and that are fully integrated into um, in, into most platforms now, e-commerce platforms. Uh, there's an HS code identification. So what you can do there is you can drop a li simple list of all your products, and it can the data can be as raw uh, as you like. Um, most of it's done uh, by, um, it, it's automated now, it's through AI, and we do uh, millions of HS lookup codes uh, a year around the world now. Uh, so 90% of your products, it's, it's automated for us to give you the correct HS code. And um, 
if there's, there's a, if we haven't been able to, we'll we'll give you back the errors that we find, and together we can work through on a manual basis how to get it done. Then we just run it through um, the tariff calculator, and that can all be done. Again, it's fully integrated through an API. That can be done live uh, within a, a millisecond uh, in the live checkout, and the tariffs tariffs will come back uh, precisely. So um, yeah, so it's all very simple, straightforward, and automated. Brilliant. Um, and does ShipStation, this will be one for you, Andrew, have support for CN22 customs declaration? Correct, we do. Great, nice and easy, that one. Um, and do you think there are more surprises coming as we understand the details of the free trade agreement? <laughs> That's a great question. I think... Uh... I'll let Richard take the, the tax elements. I think we're just, um, I don't know if there's more surprises, I think in our world of sort of the mechanical process, I think it's just um, people frankly getting used to it. You know, I think people are just in the fog at the moment of actually trying to understand. We just get questions all day, every day about how do we do, you know, how do we do this? What's required? So I think the compliance, if that's the right word, the compliance, um, processes and burden obligations I think are just becoming obvious to to our um, UK based customers particularly who are feeling the pain so I, I don't know Richard you I feel like you're kind of more at the tip of the sphere we're, we're definitely sort of behind the scenes that we're seeing just lots of um, just a learning curve very very aggressive learning curve for, for retailers to understand what you know what does this actually mean at a mechanical process yeah. business process level uh, and, and that's kind of, you know, that's our world every day. So I don't know if you have any perspective on things that we haven't thought about or things that are coming down the coming down the road. Um, no, I'd agree. It, you know, we're trying to def divide everything into two. What is the learning curve? Um, because we're all learning what these forms are. You can hear in the questions, um, what, 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 what do I put in this document? And once we, once you get through that, then um, uh, things should quieten down versus what's forever. And um, the reality is um, we um, th there's just going to be more compliance, more registrations. Obviously, everyone's going to have to do uh, customs declarations. I think going back to the question on the um, on the uh, CTA, the uh, sorry, the trade and cooperation agreement, the um, the most of it. Um, and this is surprising. Well, maybe it's not surprising because, you know, I've been tracking and reading it all day long for years um on the vat side it was all known back in june uh, 2016 the you know the moment the results of the referendum came out we all knew extra vat registrations uh, import vats um so there's nothing surprising there and customs declarations um as soon as boris johnson decided in i think it was october 2019 once he you know, once he got into power, that we were coming out of the customs union and we were going to abandon Theresa May's uh, plan of of staying in there with a uh, with a backstop. Then, uh, dec uh, sorry, declarations. It was all known there. Uh, and then, obviously, um, in the in the negotiations, the trade agreement, cooperation uh, negotiations. I think the the UK failed uh, on several of its several of its objectives um and and that's where the pain is going to come that we're not seeing yet so it is known it's just and it probably comes under andrew's category it's there we just haven't learned it yet uh so customs declarations in particular because there's no requirement or you can defer your customs your uk customs import declarations until the first of july there's some variations on that um for certain uh products and sps the sanitary and photosanitary uh, checks as well. I think tariffs is the ugly one. It's it's the rules of origin. The UK failed to get cumulative uh, uh, origin rules. And I think that's where there may be a, 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 some scope for improvement. So what I mean by that is um, if goods, uh, and there's an example, the, the commission came out a couple of days ago talking about this. They said, uh, and I think they were being rather overzealous and cruel, if you're a UK business and you've bought stock, ironically, ahead of Brexit, the end of the transition period, if you bought it from, let's say, France and you shipped it to uh, the UK 
um, you got it into the UK because you wanted to avoid any tariffs. Because we didn't get the right cumulative deal, um, it means those French goods, when you ship them back uh, to France, they will be classified as not originating from the UK. Um, and uh, so even though you thought you were being clever um, by uh, planning ahead of uh, any tariffs, or uh, that came out of the uh, trade and cooperation agreement, you've actually fallen foul. And uh, I think that's where we need some some changes and flexibility uh, around. So, um, no, I think I agree with Andrew in short. It's, it's all there, unfortunately. We're just having to learn it piece by piece. I think certainly what we're focusing on is, um, is really trying to make this as formulaic as we can. Um, we're building more and more checks um, you know, things like you can't effectively generate a label um, until you have the components that you need, like an ERE number or HS code. So I think it's particularly as we um, collaborate more with the Avalara team, you know, we're trying to really take some of that manual thinking that um, our collective retailers may have to, or that, you know, the, even the warehouse teams would have to think about. So that's certainly a big focus for us. I think as, you know, like any new process, as you get further down the learning curve, then you want to um, automate and operationalize it and, and that's that's really our main focus at the moment is to try and do some of the thinking on behalf of the retailer so they don't have to validate you know x y and z every day thank you um and some carriers have asked for something called a preferential statement is there any further information on this i don't have any Further information, Richard. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah, I suspect that's a statement of origin they're talking about, um, and this is to ensure that you qualify for the preferential or the zero tariffs. So um, the the good news is that the carrier shouldn't um, shouldn't be asking for that, and I'll explain why. So what will happen eventually in in a year's time is uh, if I import goods, if I'm UK. Uh, retail and I import goods from uh, China, uh, then I have to ask for a statement of origin um, from my um, from the source of the goods, and then I have to include that in my invoice if I then sell the goods uh, to France. And uh, it's it's just a few words that you can just tack on to um, to the invoice, and the wording is actually buried somewhere in the. Uh, trade and cooperation agreement but um, wherever you get the goods from if you're in the UK you uh, will need a statement of origin because if you want to say well in that case we couldn't claim that the goods originated um, in the UK they're obviously Chinese so if you ship them then to France you definitely have to pay tariffs uh, but if you can get a statement of origin from your supplier saying that the goods are genuinely UK um, of UK origin then uh, then that's um, that's very helpful. The alternative is you can self-certificate, and I suspect thinking about it, maybe that's what the questioner is asking for. In which case, you take on responsibility that the goods, all of the components of the goods, originated from the UK. Um, most businesses don't do that because uh, you, you take on all sorts of liabilities. What you want to get is a statement of origin from from your suppliers, so that um, you're you're covered uh, there. Uh, now, the, uh, both sides in the uh, TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, agreed to waive the statement of origin requirement for 12 months just to get everybody uh, to prepare. So I think what everyone took away from that is actually um, you you should uh, you should know that your goods originated from the UK and you don't have to produce any paperwork, uh, but it, it's on a matter of trust. So woe betide you if you uh, if you get caught. Um, uh, doing that is that hopefully that's helpful uh yeah i think we've not had any follow-up question from that so i think that's answered it um just one more question that we've got then um so how can we keep track of the fiscal rep obligations you mentioned it's changing daily yes i probably uh for comedic effect i might have said daily it's I'm, i exaggerated honestly it's only weekly uh there's a blog, I, I can't remember if I, I think I mentioned it. If you look up now on Google, do I need a fiscal rep after Brexit? We have a, uh, a blog there and uh, I'm sure ship, state, uh, ship station sorry, will can provide it uh, a URL to you. Uh, it lists all the countries and whether you need a fiscal rep. 
uh, yes or no. And as I promise, I commit to, we keep that very live. Uh, so for example, we just updated Italy a few days ago to say, good news is you don't. Um, if you're, the countries to look out for are Poland, um, because we, we, we're hopeful Poland will change their mind. We think Belgium uh, will change their mind as well. So there's a, you know, Belgium obviously is a very, very important country for UK businesses importing um, into Europe using um, uh, Antwerp, uh, which is a very, very busy port. Great, thank you. Um, unless either of the speakers have got anything to add or unless we've got any other questions, um, I think that's that's it for all the questions. Um, but yeah, th big thank you to uh, Andrew and Richard for sharing your expertise and giving us some coaching today. And thanks everyone for your participation and for all the questions. Uh, we'll be sending out the recording next week along with how to contact us and Avalara as well for any more information. So please feel free to reach out at any point. We're always more than happy to facilitate any demos for your teams or for your customers. So just let us know how we can help. And thank you again for joining. And I hope you found it useful today and enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks for making time. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Thanks, Andrew. Bye bye.